Hi everyone, um, welcome to Artsfest Online and to this afternoon's workshop on trademarks and branding with Dr. Mika Potoshnik. Um, please do switch on your cameras if you're able to. We, we would like this to be as interactive as possible. And of course, you're always welcome to chip in with any questions as we go along, or do put them in the chat. Um, just a quick reminder that this event is being recorded, so um, please don't share any confidential information as it is a public platform, even though it does feel like a very small room. Um, so welcome all, and um, over to you, Mecca. Thank you, Claire. Um, I will start sharing my screen and for every for, for my presentation really. and for anyone who's attended one of our workshops beforehand, um, you will know that the um, format of these workshops is meant to be interactive. It's meant to be open to, to questions as they come along. I tend to pick on Claire quite a bit, but that's only because I know her. I don't know the rest of you well enough to, to sort of pick on you with questions. Although James, I think, has attended one of the previous ones. So potentially, yes, potentially another person. Um, and uh, we have also, is it Rebecca who has her camera on? Anyway, so um, the today's session is focusing on trademarks. And if you do have a question, whether it's something that you've already uh, encountered in practice so you just want to go to that issue and just ask without you know waiting for the entire thing to sort of unravel you're welcome to do that as well um, but I sort of have a tentative order that I thought might be helpful to go through and then either as we go along you ask a question or at the end or whenever you sort of feel inspired to to ask the question now, technically, we have two hours for the workshop, but we'll see. I don't have that many slides, and I don't think it's helpful when you're being introduced into a, a topic to focus on too much content, rather than just maybe focus on the questions you might have around this. Now, this is a, a, an art fest um, event, so we might be thinking why trademarks, and, and hopefully, at least by, by seeing what trademarks are, you will, as artists, start think about start thinking about that potentially this is an intellectual property right you might want to register or get your hands on so we'll go through what is a trademark what are the benefits of a registered trademark and how do you get one if you don't have one yet and then also the the the, the coolest part at least in my mind is what can't you get a, as a trademark and that goes to parody and free speech uh, considerations in trademark law so you will see also you can, and not just now, I do tend to check, although for now it's just me tweeting under that, but there is a hashtag attached to these workshops as well. So if ever in the future you want to sort of just, you know, use that hashtag to start a debate with maybe some of the other participants that have attended, please do so. Or if you want to get in touch um, via email or Twitter individually with myself, I would really welcome you welcome it and so just be in touch if you have any questions now or later or if you have perhaps suggestion for going forward with Claire we would also welcome topics for workshops maybe from September or October onwards so it's, it's sort of an ongoing thing we have here okay um, Claire I'm just checking that there are no burning questions before we we continue or maybe from the floor if anyone wants to sort of raise a question before we start no. Uh, Claire, you're muted. Uh, sorry, I'm on mute. Um, there's one from Isaac. Um, a question about overused names. Does anyone actually own the trademark for A1 taxis, minicabs, etc.? Uh, sorry, so for, for which names? A1 taxis, minicabs. Um, so I will tell you how to check that. I don't know it by heart. So I don't know the register by heart. Okay. Uh, and certain, certain trademarks that have popped up in, in sort of you know, either with, with generally going to the market or just in, in cases. And as we study, I might know if trademarks are registrable, registered already, but I will show you how to check that. So exactly how to answer that question, I will, I will tell you where on the register. But if you're very keen, Isaac, to do it now, you just Google UK trademark search and it will take you to the government UK IPO, so Intellectual Property Office website, and you search for it. But I will show you also the screen grab, the screenshot. For oh, can I just, just really quickly jump in? That It was a bit of a facetious question, actually, because um, obviously A1 Taxis is like probably the most overused name in the world. 
So it's just a question of kind of when a thousand people are calling themselves one thing, how does that work? But you can answer that later on. Absolutely. You, and don't, you don't need to answer that now. It's just kind of one of those things where like the, you find A1 taxis in every, con- in every city, almost anywhere in the world. So it's just one of those things. Absolutely. And it's a great point on what is a good trademark and a question of distinctiveness. So Isaac, do feel free to pop back in when we start our discussion. So what is a good trademark? We'll, we'll come to that. And I think it's a really important point for anyone who's trying to start their business in a particular market. So whether you're thinking of going into graphic design or you're thinking to, to sort of be in the business of particular items or services, goods or services, and you're trying to communicate with the consumer what you do, this question of whether you're using a sign which just says what you do, so you use a descriptive term, is something to be very much aware of. And and it's not always an advisable strategy. So it's it's an important point, Isaac. I absolutely agree. (laughs) And there are sort of rules that regulate that as well. So I'll come to that when we talk about how do you get registration and and what do you choose as a sign under registration. So what is a trademark and why do I have that cafe there? Um, Trademark is an intellectual property right, which we will look into some of the details. But we're looking at course of trade, trade market type situations. So you're looking at businesses, you're looking at selling either goods or services, okay? Of course, there's a variety of types of goods and services that are out there, but that's what we're looking at. Um, The only time where you're not looking at a business, but you're thinking as an artist, there are certain points of, can I use other people's trademarks to create my own work? And I do have just one slide where hopefully we'll have a little bit of a discussion on that as well. Now, today's workshop, and we can sort of come up with, we have a very uh, talented and brilliant colleague at the business school, Khairia Dergic, and she's in in branding. So we often also do joint workshops, or we have uh, the possibility of looking into branding uh, from a marketing or a business side of things as well. Um, But my point was sort of an a larger one uh, to make today to say that brands and trademarks, almost like two sides of one coin, although brand is a larger side of a different coin. So brand is an umbrella term and trademarks might be one way of protecting that umbrella, might, might be one way of protecting some aspects of your brand image, but they're not the same. And despite the fact that they're not the same, many authors or you know you will see it used in practice in newspapers in in all sorts of communication they will say brand where they mean trademark and and opposite as well so brands are marketing terms trademarks are legal terms legal rights and why do they convert so much is you see that so from the this is a way of just perhaps highlighting why trademarks and brands are so connected is that trademarks capture the essence of brands and the energy investment and know-how that goes into them. And that's a very, very optimistic statement, if you will. Where we see most overlap with trademarks and brands is when you're having brands with, or trademarks with reputation, really well-known trademarks there, the legal protection you get almost covers the entire umbrella, almost covers all aspects of the brand as a marketing asset as well. So trademarks, what we're, call, uh, what we're discussing today, we're going to focus on the legal side of things. I'm not going to be speaking to, you know, I don't even know, there are three Ps and all sorts of things, right? When you're looking at brand value, image, what you stand for, what you want to project to the world and so forth. There are obviously experts who can speak to branding and I've mentioned just um, one of them from the business school. And if that's something to consider, maybe going forward as one of the Art Fest workshops, we can look into that. Legally, however, we we just need to be aware that trademarks are not the same as brands and and the terminology is different as well. So what is a trademark? A trademark is a legal right in a sign which is used in the course of trade in commerce. What is a sign? So a trademark is a legal right that protects a sign. Now, the the easiest way to, to think about trademarks and signs are personal names, right? We have personal names so that it's easier to communicate with each other when we are all together. So if you think of uh, um, 
you know, a, a mom going to shop with her three kids. And if she would always be, hey, the eldest, hey, the youngest, or, you know, the tallest or the shortest, by description, that would take much more time than just saying John, Anne, whatever are the names of the ch children, right? And you can think about those shortcuts or short terms, uh, which are signs or trademarks, when you go to a shop and you're trying to find your favorite brand of tea, your favorite trademark, your favorite tea that you've always sort of been buying and purchasing for a long period of time, how do we sort of get used to recognizing that a particular name or sign will correlate to your positive experience from the past is you, you, you start recognizing that name as the name of something you can trust, something you value, and something that is of good quality. So you see the name, you will not only trust that, oh, this is a product I've bought in the past, I've liked it, you will also start trusting that a new product under that name will probably give you positive returns if you were to buy it. The upside, or if we didn't have trademarks in the market, is you would have items, goods, or services, if you're thinking about it, you would have items in, in a shop, and you would go from one to another, try to compare the ingredients that are there and say, right, I want to have tea, but I don't want to have caffeine or tea, teaine in it. I want to have herbal tea, but so it gets much more complicated and the decisions around that because become much more difficult. They're not so easily made, they're not as transparent, and most importantly, it takes time, right? So these signs and how you sort of choose them will dictate how your consumers, the people you're trying to reach in the market, how, how easily they will find you, right? And that's why it's important. Yes, maybe in the beginning you're thinking, oh, people should know what I do. So you're thinking, I should say I have the best services. But on the long run, everyone has the best services, or as Isaac said, you have all these types of taxis, you have them in every city, so they no longer stand out. That's like everyone being called John, all the men in the world being called John. Then it no longer becomes a, a name that you can actually rely on and successfully use, because if you were in a classroom, say John, all the men are John, everyone would be looking up. It no longer really works well as a name. So a sign is uh, what we protect is that commercial symbol that will have the capacity to be recognized by the consumer and it will indicate the commercial source of the goods. So the origin function is the whole reason why we have legal protection in trademarks. So whether it's a logo, a word or a combination of those that will function as a beacon of commercial source. This is coming from X company or from X trader. That's all. That's the point of trademarks. Okay. Now, you're not here for a trademark class and how we protect them in, in that, but just sort of a way of thinking why an artist might think about this is if you're putting items or services, so if you're putting on training workshops or other kind of services, you might be in contact with consumers. And when you are in contact with consumers, you might be thinking about using symbols that will allow the consumers to identify you as standing out from everyone else's goods or services in the market. So what, what we protect with a trademark is a sign can be anything really. Words, letters, numbers, logos, colors, shapes, sounds. With the last one, two, three, colors, shapes, and sounds, you have to be careful because um, there are certain rules around how do you put that on the register so we know exactly what is on the register, what is a protected trademark. So you can't just register all types of color green. You won't be allowed to do that. Yeah, <laughs> as much as that could be of interest as a broad monopoly, we do have to keep consumers and competitors in, in mind. Now, in theory, you could also protect scent, so what things smell like, but we don't have practically a way yet to objectively register scent like we do with colors, right? With colors, we have Pantone number, blah, blah, blah. So we all know which is the color or the shade of yellow we're talking about referring to in our registration. For scents, once we have a, a detector, I don't know why I always think it's gonna come in a device like a little uh, portable vacuum machine Anyway, so if we do end up with having devices that will identify sense objectively, then nothing in the law would stop such a registration as well, okay? 
So that's first. You have to think about the sign you want to use in communication with consumers that will act as a beacon, as a signaling function to the goods or services are coming from you. You are the commercial source of those goods or services and nobody else. And then the second thing to, to really keep in mind is that trademarks are used or registered for specific goods and services. So you don't get a registration of a particular word, Kodak, for all goods out there. That's not how the system works. You might eventually come to these types of marks, which are so well known because they have been extensively used. Now, extensively used might mean, you know, over many, many decades, as you have it with McDonald's and McDonald's sort of not only with the length of time, but also geographically, right? They're almost in all parts of the world. You might have just intensive use, right? So Pfizer is something that probably not everyone would be like, oh yeah, I know Pfizer. But since last year and the development of vaccines, I think consumers are now seeing Pfizer thinking, oh, they make vaccine. And of course, so many others. So it's a pharmaceutical company, right? And you then have these kind of well-known famous marks, or in the UK terms, we call these marks with reputation, that will give you more protection than just a normal mark. Now, how would you get that as, as an individual or as a business owner? It just comes down to you having used this mark for such a successful, whether it's a period of time or intense use, that you're able to satisfy a legal test. There are certain rules that you show that a significant portion of the public links this mark to your goods or services. So they start recognizing you. And if you have that, you will have a extra level of protection. So it's possible to get these kind of marks. Now, as an artist, you also have to be aware that when marks are really well known, they have that extra layer of protection. So you might not be able to use them as freely in your own work. And we'll come to that as well, okay? So why register a trademark? Why pay the fees and why bother to go through the process, okay? Now, quite practically, if you work keeping accounts and if you were thinking about maybe using uh, some kind of financial assets to secure a loan or things like that, trademarks are property rights and they are considered also to be intangible property rights that count as business assets. So, uh, and I don't know how the accounting of it all works, but you could think of that, especially once you start building the goodwill around that, once you start using the trademark for a long period of time, the value might also grow with, um, so the assessment of the trademark. But that's something separate to, um, to really what we want to focus on. One of the points is you don't necessarily have to register the trademark to get some kind of protection in the UK. So in the UK, just as you would in the US, if you're using a sign in trade, in the course of trade, so you're actually selling products or offering services, let's say under a particular name, you will get some kind of protection. That some kind of protection usually means you will only get protected when somebody else comes along and they start selling the goods, pretending to be you. That's the confusion. When the consumer buys the goods or services, they are misled to think that what they're buying is coming from you and it's not. So that's the most classic type of protection. And if you are to register that particular sign, you will usually have different kinds of protection that are broader than, than what I've just said against consumer confusion very narrowly. Um, and there's a, another more, more practical advantage to this, and that is really that you have evidence that you have this legal right, because registration will give you a number, and it's very easy to, to just sort of refer to that registration number if somebody else starts using. Now, what is the point of having a registered trademark? What can you do? There are two types of actions you can do once you have a registered trademark. One is you can stop other people from registering the same trademark as you already have, or if it's not in stopping other people to register something that is the same as you have it, it's stopping other people from using the same trademark as you've put on the register 
in the marketplace. So what can you stop? You can stop other people from using your identical sign, let's say it's Kodak, on identical goods. So if I'm selling pencil, so and somebody else is using Kodak on pencils, I can stop that. What I can also stop is somebody using not only identical, but also similar signs. So instead of Kodak, it's Bodak. And not only on identical goods, but similar goods. And similar goods do have a, a very extensive interpretation that sometimes it will also work in complementary, complementary goods. So if I'm selling Kodak toothbrushes and you're selling Bodak toothpaste, without doubt, I can stop it. Now, I'm not going to, so what will be confusing, so the second type of action we can stop in the marketplace or even in registration proceedings is identical similar signs on identical similar goods. So it's either an identical sign on similar goods or similar sign on identical goods or similar sign on similar goods that cause confusion as to commercial source. So people seeing that trademark, which is not yours, somebody else is using it, on identical or similar goods. So you can think about chocolate being similar to biscuits, or if it is, I don't know, shirts being similar to, to pants, or you know, they're sort of groupings of goods and services. But would that confuse the average consumer? Now, the average consumer is not stupid. They are considered to be, you know, they will read and they will see the presentation, they will take the marks holistically in the market. So we're not concerned with the most attentive of people in the marketplace or the most, you know, sort of not paying attention at all. We look at the average consumer and the average consumer is reasonably well informed about the state of affairs in the marketplace. They're reasonably uh, um, uh, paying attention and they're circumspect. So those are the types of situations you can stop with any trademark. So identical signs on identical goods or similarity in either of the two. So similar signs and similar goods. And I'm not gonna go into legalities, but the first one is easier to show than the second one. Okay, so when you have identical sign on identical goods, it's almost automatic infringement. You can stop that. With the second one, you need to show evidence of confusion in the market. It need not be actual con confusion. You can just show likelihood of confusion. So it's not that you have to bring evidence of those people were confused when they bought it, okay? The third one is where we talk about dilution type claim, where we talk about marks with reputation. So that's the largest scope, the broadest scope of protection you will get. That is when we have something that looks like a famous mark, something that it resembles, will create a link in the mind of the consumer between that famous mark. So whether it's Dior, so, you know, Dior, you could think about Bior, right? Instead of D, you would have B. Sounds the same. Looks different. Of course, there's a difference there, but, you know, would the, the consumer think of that link? Could do. So you just need to show that the sign that the third party is using is creating a link in the mind of the consumer, and then you can stop the use of such a party, even on goods which are different. So for example, could you be selling Rolex uh, washing up liquid? You can't because protection given for marks that have broader protection, uh, so marks with reputation is more extensive. So owners of these marks with reputation have more protection. So there are no Dior shoes, there are no Dior watch, well, I don't know, maybe Dior makes watches, so let me be very good. There are no Dior laptops, there are no Dior bananas, there are no, so unless Dior is sort of putting it to the market, there are no other products carrying that name under the sort of the, the statement that, oh, Dior is not making that, they don't have to. So under that extra level of protection, you're able to stop everyone else to use that sign in the course of trade. And we'll come back to what happens if you're using it, you know, parody purposes or just because you wanna have fun. Or maybe you wanna criticize some of the, the uh, company policies. So people have been using Greenpeace. So Greenpeace has been using um, different oil companies' trademarks in order to make a point around environmental protection and pollution. 
what would happen in those cases. And I think as an artist, you might actually be sort of tempted sometimes to, to communicate through trademarks because they carry, especially the marks that are really well known, they carry those cultural messages. Claire, do we have questions popping up? Sorry, it's on mute. Um, I think you might have answered Isaac's question, um, but I'll just reiterate. Um, so he says, isn't the extensive uh, use rule a bit too op open to interpretation? If McDonald's have trademarks in the burger class only, why should a plumber not be allowed to be McDonald's, um, i.e. in a different class? But I think you've just kind of covered that. So there's a very specific doctrine around why do we give this extensive protection. Sometimes it's referred to as the death by a thousand cuts. It's the dilution doctrine, which basically I, I sort of when it when I teach this to my law students, I talk about the lighthouse. So you think about a lighthouse in a dark night and the lighthouse has obviously a very strong message, right? It will bring the sh ships from the sea easily. You can see the light. Nobody will get lost or you know hit the rocks as it were and if you were to have a just one little cottage on the shoreline putting on their light that very first light that will not in any way affect the strength of the light coming from the lighthouse it wouldn't just like the first cut very small cut we, we can all sort of appreciate what a death by a thousand cuts would be that first one doesn't really endanger you as as a um as a start. Now, the, the theory behind it is that we need, we can't allow these kind of uses because the collective effect of them actually would be to reduce something, the power of a market reputation that previously existed. So, you know, you don't even have to say McDonald's. You, you, you just show the arches and that's it. You show part of the arch. The consumer recognition is such so high that and that would get lost not with the first one, not with the first, not with the plumber using McDonald's, but if everyone was allowed to use, if you had McDonald's plumbers, if you had McDonald's laptops, if you had McDonald's, I don't know, tea, coffee, and all sorts of things, then at a certain stage, McDonald's, as you know, yes, burger, fast food, whatever they offer, um, that, that would, the strength of that mark would be reduced. Not everyone agrees necessarily that that's the best way of protecting these symbols. And there's a lot of tension also in the literature, um, but that's the theory behind why do we stop? So Isaac mentioned the plumber and McDonald's. Okay, um, interesting one from Elizabeth. Um, what about brands uh, when they do collaborations? <laughs> is that Elizabeth, my Elizabeth from um, the law school or is it a-, a, a I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> She says yes. But then she should be answering that question and she should be on camera and helping me out. So, um, uh, Elizabeth, you're welcome to pop on camera and, and contribute to the debate. I think it's always more fun when more people speak. Brand collaborations, that is part of a contract and an agreement how they will project the message. And they have very specific rules of, around how long that will last, what happens after the relationship stops, who will be able to use the trademark. So brand collaborations can be very, very helpful and they will cre create network, offense, uh, um, uh, network effects, but they are a tricky business for, for people who haven't had experience in the past. But, you know, Elizabeth, you can, if you have any observations, you wanna come in on that point? Uh, thank you. Um, um, I was asking because, um, I was following what you were saying, and um, I think you you sounded very specific. So I wanted I wanted to clarity. That's why I asked because um, nowadays you have, especially during COVID, you have like high fashion brands doing yeah um, collaborations with like soap companies. I th I guess to promote you know everyone going out to wash their hands and wearing masks. So that's why I, I'm I was asking, and by now I have my answer that they're doing this. They have a limited time frame. Time. Uh yeah, and it's a great point, Elizabeth, in the sense that if if you have, um, let's say, companies giving away their IP rights or what looks like they're giving away their IP rights temporarily, that means they're doing it, they're giving permission for that use under certain conditions. And that doesn't mean it opens the floodgates for everyone to do whatever they want with that trademark or, you know, you will see that also in copyright contexts and others as well. Uh, but yes, uh, it, it's a well-made point. We see, we see, we've seen quite a few of the 
perfume and other types of producers making hand sanitizers and yeah. other, when they had these um, factories across Europe, I think that was sort of yeah. Uh, projection. Yeah. Thank you so much for answering my question. No, no, you're uh, now I can pick on you, Elizabeth. I know. I've been here. I was stuck a little bit, but like, I'm, I, I finally got in. Perfect. Um, it, it's interesting though because I think um, artists do a lot of collaborations as well, and um, and so I think uh, it's a really good point, Elizabeth. I'm really glad you brought that up um, because I know a lot of fellow artists. Um, they're doing collaborations all the time, and uh, you know I don't know if they're perhaps not aware of. I wonder how many people are kind of aware of 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 that notion of or that side of the collaboration. So yeah, it's an interesting one. And it's exactly, I think it was in photography workshop, right? It, uh, sort of, they all start merging a little bit together. But I think we have that question of joint authorship, right? Yeah, yeah. So whenever you're looking at an intellectual property law area or right, and you have more than one person being part of that project, it's always well worth having that conversation. And then whatever you've agreed, just put it down, whether it's pen or paper or email or whatever is the format write down those agreements. Now, of course, in, in, in brand collaboration or trademarks, it depends. So if you're putting together products to, that will feature in the market, and you know, sometimes it could also be, so that is actually something that happens quite often. You have somebody that wants to use a logo in the course of trade. So they will hope to get, because remember I said the sign can be almost anything, um, and they will hope to have a logo drawn by an expert, by an artist. So it's, it's a work of visual graphic art and that's protected by copyright. You have your friend, your mate doing the logo for you. And they say, here you go, you like it, yeah, 20 quid mm -hmm. or whatever, right? Or for free, whatever is the agreement, whatever is the current relationship. Then you go off and you register it as a trademark. And then what happens if, if that artist once the trademark becomes really well known and accepted by the consumers, if that artist says, well, I've never transferred copyright, I've given you permission temporarily, but now maybe it's time for me to get better paid for, for what seems to now re work really well. So having that conversation that when you're buying a logo, and it need not even be from a friend, sometimes you will see these websites that will offer to, to, to sell you a logo, you need to read those rules very carefully. Are they giving you exclusively so transferring copyright to you so nobody else has the right to use that? Are the rules around copyright very clear so that once you register this as a trademark, you will not have a conflict? So yes, collaborations, I think these are the types of things you do need to be aware of. And, and if these are not commonplace conversations amongst uh, artists collaborating, I think it's a point well made to, you know, they should be. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no single way of regulating a relationship. Whatever it is, it needs to happen on purpose and the conversation needs to be had beforehand. And I, I would say this much that if there are contracts in front of you that are too complex, do get a lawyer to read it. It's like a dentist situation, right? If, if it's something you can just brush your teeth and goes away, great. If, if more work needs to be done, you'll go to a dentist. You're not going to just try, right, I think I have a cavity here, mm, but they will charge me X or, you know, NHS takes forever. So I'll just go and do it. So there are certain situations definitely where taking legal advice, none of which what I'm talking about today in the sense of how do I get a trademark wouldn't require you to, to get legal advice because there's a lot of information put on, on the government website with their hope to bring trademarks closer to individuals and businesses. But definitely, if you were to think about branding collaborations, or if you were to think about a well-established business and they approach you and you're not really sure what to do, it also gives you some kind of a, a power if you have actually somebody giving you legal advice and then just suggesting on your behalf that there might be certain parts of the agreement that are not really favorable to you. So it's not just you flagging it, you actually get expert advice to say this part of the agreement needs to be looked at again. So whatever it is, as long as you know that you're accepting certain terms and what they mean, it's then free on you. It's your will to do it or not. Um, but yeah, definitely. Okay, uh, thanks for that question, Elizabeth. Um, one from Isaac. He asks, do these companies pay for extra protection once they have reputation? 
No. <laughs> I was hoping that everyone. <gasps> um, the renewal fee. So how does it work? Once and we're we're, we're going to be that will be the next step, right? So how do you get a trademark? And once the trademark is put on the register, um, it will be valid for ten years. So you register ten years, you have a trademark. You then have to renew it if you want it to continue as a legal right. And there are certain fees attached with renewal. And then you can renew it indefinitely. So that's why we have trademarks that have been on the register since 1900s. There is no extra payment if your trademark is, um, it has reputation. Why not? Because to achieve the status of having a mark with reputation, it means you've been putting money and investment into the trademark in the first place. You've been using it in the marketplace. You've invested not only in advertising, but also in consumer relations so that the trademark is recognized by the consumer. That's where the investment side of things happens, not you paying money to the registry. It happens in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So that sort of answers. Yep. Okay. Um, that's all for now. Perfect, Claire. <laughs> I wasn't sure, you know, it looked like you said, mm, maybe. Um, there's a few comments, but I guess it's just kind of um, a sort of conversation uh, as you were speaking. Oh, perfect. But if, uh, again, just maybe to, to also uh, relieve Claire of, if, if you do want to pop in, you can just sort of either raise your hand or just unmute and just sort of, uh, if anyone has any feedback at any point in time. Um, I mean, obviously, I my own approach as a researcher to all intellectual property rights is, is quite different. And I look at intellectual property from a feminist point of view. So what I'm doing today is how the law is and how the system works. I'm not as an academic giving you, oh, this is how it should be and it's always right. Mm -hmm. So we're today looking at trademarks quite practically, but I think what the discussion shows quite, quite clearly is that this is not a straightforward issue and all intellectual property will always create conflict and tension between different stakeholders. And we all need to be aware of that. And that's why this whole approach, but I have a trademark and you know, very passionately about, ooh, everyone should stop using my name just needs to be taken a little bit uh, with a little bit more of a reservation. Actually, a few have come through. I think my um, chat is a bit slow today, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so Isaac says, so it sounds to me like the reputation law has been lobbied for, um, you know, by big business. Mm. The first time that the um, suggestion of this broader type of prote protection has been offered was actually in 1928. There was an article by Professor Schechter published around, uh, so in Harvard Law Review. And actually back then, um, the argument was that there's certain trademarks, certain signs that the businesses themselves or individuals come up with. So the original doctrine was indeed um, limited to trademarks that are invented by the owner. Kodak and other invented type words. So this broad protection was limited to those additions to existing knowledge. And yes, we have seen extension and expansion um, in trademark law and especially in Europe, there's very, very broad type of protection and arguably, yes, there, there have been clear lobbying groups behind these certain pockets of, of, um, of legislation. Um, but it's the marketplace. So this is this is regular or protecting. And that's why you see heavy, heavy presence around protecting commercial interests, business assets. So that's mainly the approach. And we will see with there being no exception for parody, at least in the UK or, or Europe, um, that you know artists and other type of uh, interests are quite limited. They're not as they're not on equal footing. So trademarks do have very strong protection. So that's why it's something that as a business owner, you wouldn't want to overlook. And as an artist wishing perhaps to use somebody else's trademark, you really do need to be aware of where the lines are. Um, if you don't want to, or, you know, if you want to take the fight to, to the man, as it were, uh, then great, just be aware that it can happen and has happened in the past. Okay. 
I'm pretty sure when we come to the uh, registration limitations or no, no, there will be further discussion to be had. So let me just sort of maybe to do to to point to some of the things to think about if you were to register a trademark, right? Or if you have registered, uh, I mean, it always breaks my heart a little bit when people have already gone through the registration and then I say certain rules and they go, do you mean my trademark is not good? I will not make any kind of assessment. So this is me based on what I've read in cases and what I see as rules around what will make for a successful application. These are tips or not even tips. These are assessments or evaluations, reflections for what would perhaps be a good strategy if you're coming up with something anew afresh, right? Um, and you will see, I will show you also the portals online. They're, they're very straightforward. And we've actually, with Elizabeth together, we've helped some of the local businesses around registration questions. So we were sort of canvassing what is already on the registry and so forth. It's something that, well, at least for students, it's quite fun to do. Perhaps if you're choosing your trademark forever, uh, it might be perhaps a bit more of a um, heavy decision to make, but it shouldn't be. So uh, you can do it yourself. You don't have to have a lawyer for this. You can do it yourself uh, and you can do it easily online very easily steps one to three and um, i'll even show you the the fees around this is a, a few hundred pounds so compared to other intellectual property rights such as patents where i would never suggest you even attempt of registering a patent on your own trademark is actually something that can sort of be investigated and done on your own um, at least to maybe understand what will be required around the registration um, if you think that your business is perhaps or your needs, business needs are more complex because you're not operating only in the UK, maybe you're operating also in Europe or in other places, just sort of a, a, a reminding that all trademarks, just like copyright, just like uh, patents, just like design right, all intellectual property rights are territorial rights. And with the UK having left the EU, we no longer get this immediate access to the EU market, right? And that means trademarks as well. So in the past, you would reg register a EU trademark and it would cover, it was a regional, right? It would cover all 28 member states. Now, if you want to get a trademark or register trademark in the UK, you will register it with the UK Intellectual Property Office and that gives you protection here in the UK. If your business takes you to your Europe as well, you might want to consider registering an EU trademark, and that will get you protected in the single market in the 27 member states. Okay, so if you do have more complex things to, to think about, um, you might want to sort of speak to somebody who's, you will have experts in, in trademark services. So you, we call them trademark attorneys. Okay, so what you would have to think about is first choose your sign. And that is where maybe also you and your branding expert, your marketing expert might have a conversation. If you're the, the one person doing everything and just have that conversation and um, a selection with yourself. So sort of try to make a decision, word, logo, name, and other things, like we said, um, it's very, very open. What you would want to, and we'll, we'll sort of speak about that um, in, in a few minutes, you would want to avoid descriptive terms and you would want to avoid things that are not seen by consumers as trademarks. So if you were to think about colors, when you're walking across, if you're uh, thinking about, you know, um, I don't know, selling postcards or maybe selling um, uh, notebooks with, with particularly nice artistic cover, right? You using a color as your trademark will be seen as decorative. It, it's not something that the consumer seeing, I don't know, a, a splash of purple over that color or maybe on the wrapping, they might think, oh, pretty. If they see, however, a word, you know, zing, whatever, I can't make up a word right here on the spot but if they see a word mark they say oh it's claire's but claire would be descriptive but it's you know claire zinga's notebooks so if that they'll say oh that's the that's the trademark that's the brand i'm always after right um so you would have to think about right what would consumers see as this sign of commercial source as an indicator of commercial source um, if you think about food uh, and what we've seen in the past in, in cases, so they, they try to say that the shape of butter, they were little, I don't know what, I think it was flower shapes, 
that that is something that should be registered as a trademark. And if, if you go to the market and you're sort of thinking about buying things, confectionery items, you look at usually the names, maybe you'll look at the entire packaging, but it, you will be careful also of not just looking at the packaging because in the UK we do have lookalikes. So you'll start with the name, that's the most traditional type of a trademark and then build from there. Of course, again, and that goes to marks that are used through advertising and in the marketplace, there are certain trademarks that have not, that are not just word marks, but have through advertising and use been really successful and are recognized instantaneously by consumers. So if I were to say chocolate and have a break, do we know which chocolate I'm thinking about? Kit Kat. Okay. I'll, I'll take that everyone knew that. If not, it's just me and Claire. Right. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but have a break is not, it, it, it's three words in, in English language, right? And it's through marketing and advertising, have a break, have a Kit Kat extensively that you would now sort of associate it quite, quite quickly. I would probably have to say chocolate or maybe even not. Sometimes I just say have a break in class and people start, oh, Kit Kat. So mm. it's quite recognizable. If you think about Coca-Cola and the shape, the bottle shape, that's something you recognize. Even if there's no signature or, or uh, so you will have just the silhouette, um, you know, you, you, you recognize it because it's been used so heavily in advertising marketing and just being sold in the marketplace and having done really well in the past, okay? So when you are thinking about registration, you're thinking about the sign, um, you need to think about the goods and services and each, so there's around 200 pounds-ish to, to get a, a registered trademark. So one sign and, and for one, class of goods or services okay so you might have so the the one of the classes sort of for services the advertising uh, so that's class 30, 35 is very often seen and you have sort of a few types of services that would fall on there so you have to use at least one but you can just go through the selection and see what would be and so the first one is around 200 and then if you're adding on classes Make sure that's the type of goods or services you are thinking about offering, because otherwise in a few years time, people could come after you and say, you're not using it for shoes, so it's gonna be canceled for shoes. So think about the goods and services where you're thinking about using it. And then if you wanna in a few years time expand, so you first focus on, I don't know, advertising because that's part of your uh, work. But then you say, you know what, actually, I do want to start making uh, stationery. It's just a spin off. You can add that to the registration as well. Um, so think about what you're going to use. So what are the goods and services? And there's also, uh, so once you've made your selection around what you want to register, sign for goods and services, you then need to check the register. So we've had this discussion a little bit already. You need to check that nobody else has put your identical selection on the register. So exactly the sign you want it. And that could quite easily happen if, if you're using something that's part of the English language, right? So if we said Claire's cupcakes, that's potentially already registered. It wouldn't be surprising. Now, if you register Claire's cupcakes for books, maybe not, right? So Claire cup, Claire's Cupcakes for books perhaps is a unique enough of a um, choice that it hasn't been registered in, in the past year. So you need to check the register that nobody has done exactly what you select or something similar. So, you know, if, if it's not Claire's Cupcakes, if it's Claire's Tissues, but it's Claire that will be standing out. Apologies for the crazy people outside. <laughs> So it, it, you have to also see if there are similarities around what you're trying to register. So you're not allowed to, let's say, let's say we would want to register Claire's cupcakes. There's already a Claire's cupcakes there. So we would say Claire, but not Claire's. We, we would leave the apostrophe S and we wouldn't say cupcakes. We would just say cupcake one, right? just get rid of the S's and say, it's not identical. It's not exactly the same. So I'm good to go. No, you're not. 
actually under the law, it's, if it's something that consumers would notice, it's still considered identical. And, you know, even Claire's Cakes is similar enough that would be stopped under the rules that we find in trademarks, okay? Um, so you have to think about those things when you're checking. So you 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 sort of uh, search for for a close enough approximate approximation. Yeah, I see some some things, some questions popping up. Yeah. Um. So I'll come back to the one from Frank. Um. Isaac's just popped something in. Um. He said you can add to different classes to registrations later but you pay the full fee as if you were registering for the first time. If you've had the classes at point of first registration, it's a lot less. I know a few people who have fallen for this. Sorry, um, what was the, the second part of it? Um, if you add the classes at point of first registration, it's a lot less. Um, and he said that he knows a few people who have fallen for this. Yes, but that's that only works if you actually have business plans already to start doing that so you don't have to start doing it and it's absolutely true so if you the first one is 200 pounds and then if you add an additional uh, class it's 40 or 50 so it's not going to be the full 200 so yes if you know that right um, i'm rolling out i don't know cupcakes first but i know that i have everything already in place that by the end of the year i'm also going to be starting a tea shop so i'm going to actually be selling these cupcakes and serving them so i have this really nice garden hut and i'm going to have that business there if that's already in the pipeline and if not maybe for this year at least in two three years time so you have a solid business plan then great go for it if it's just something you're sort of trying to hedge your bets or whatever is the expression so if you're just sort of thinking mm, potentially this could be a plan but i don't really see it happening in the first five years so the the time frame to think about is five years because if you register something now and you're not using it for five years then somebody else can come along and say you're not using it so for that class it's going to be cancelled so you're not doing yourself you're not really saving money if you're not planning to use that trademark so yes it's true you should be thinking and that's why it's something to consider not only what you're currently selling but also what are your future plans within a few years time Okay, um, so another question here. How about registration in the USA? Is it on a federal basis or at state level? It's a, well, you have the federal Lanham Act. So you have a federal legislation, which also from the UK, you can go through the Madrid system. And so there are systems of cooperation whereby you file here in the UK, but you, you flag it as an international application. You say, I want this to be sent to the US office and you get protection there. But protection is federal, which for everyone who might not know what we're talking about, this is US level type protection, not just one state by another. So Minnesota, Florida, and others. So they would have state laws and they might have additional protections, but it is the federal act, the Lanham Act, that has protection for trademarks. And there we see, similar to what we've seen here in the UK, we have protection for both registered and unregistered trademarks, but there are different rules there. And without really going into much detail, the, one of the main differences, you really have to have proof. When you first register, you will just show intention of um, using. So you have the intention to use the trademark but the rules are out around showing proof that you have used the trademark you're applying for in, in commerce are stricter than what we have here in Europe and the UK by extension. Um, and the other main, consider, my main difference in this area of the law is um, when it comes to exceptions. Um, and that is something we see potentially crossing over or being of interest to artists. So if you were to think about parody, uh, so your artistic work, your visual work, will try to use one of the trademarks by well-known brands to, to make a point. We had cases like uh, Nadia Plisner, she used it, used it in, in the Fornica, she used the um, Louis Vuitton design. That was the bag was really a big feature of the, of the little boy. And, and she was sued based on design rights, and, but it could as 
just as easily been trademarks uh, for having depicted their design in her painting, her painting having a completely different expressive notion to that. Now, what we see in the US, we see that there are actually exceptions or defenses of parody even under trademark law. So something that remember, if you were listening to the copyright discussion we've had, we do have a fair dealing defense for parody. In UK trademark law or EU trademark law, there's no such defense. So defenses are much more limited and parody could quite easily get you in trouble with the trademark owner. Okay, but US is a whole, whole new thing. Definitely you need to sort of consider that if, if you're active in the US, if you're selling goods and services there. Um, but yes, Pedro. Okay. Um, so Isaac says, so Americans have a better sense of humor. Um, yeah. I shall refrain from commenting, shall I? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, especially, um, how, yeah. Yeah, especially how things are going <laughs> in the past few years. Um, it's actually the US that has been the largest exporter of intellectual property rights and the reason why we have such an extensive protection internationally. It is the US and the international businesses across that that are to to sort of be accredited <laughs> with, with the extensive protection we see uh, in the US. But definitely in the US, you do have this broader protection also for for marks with reputation. Uh, but because of their awareness of potential conflict and free speech being part at, at the core of um, uh, constitutional rights, so the First Amendment, um, that conflict is dealt with by courts much more clearly, much more obviously, and there are considerations for free speech also in relation to trademarks, not only with copyright. And that's something we don't see in the UK, unfortunately. Interesting. Okay. Um, and um, Frank says, thank you for the uh, comprehensive answer to the USA question. Well, you know, trademarks are, I've, I've been teaching trademarks when I was still teaching in London, so I could go on for hours. So, you know, it's trademarks are my, my starting point. This is where I started and I've seen cases in practice. And they're the best cases to, to, to get as a lawyer because your evidence box will have the goods that you're looking at. So we've had perfumes, we had, you know, children's toys and everything. So then you get to assess those trademarks. So it's, it's just quite a lot of fun. Um, and I think this sort of now will bring us back to, you know, what is a good trademark, what is the sign you might want to be choosing, um, will bring us back to Isaac's point around taxis, right? So what you do when you select your sign, and you can all think of, you know, what do you, what would you be using if you were to be selling goods or offering services, you know, uh, whether it's consultations, whatever, depending on what, what you do. Um, what would you want to be using, right, um, as the sign? Would it be a word? Would it be a, a combination of words and other symbols? Would it be a logo that you're thinking about using uh, or something different? I would definitely advise against using descriptive words. So, you know, things like using sweet for juice or, you know, playful for anything that has to do with kids and children or, you know, something being fun. These are the types of terms that, Bar from having really heavy evidence from practice of so things like, you know, have a break, have a Kit Kat. When Nestle was, um, was um, in front of the court saying that they need to have registration even just for the first half is because they had so much evidence from the marketplace. Consumers recognized, so they did surveys, they did so much evidence around consumer recognition for have a break. So unless you already have that, and you might as well, you know, sometimes you will have, you know, families been in business around something and you just want to solidify all of that. And you know that there's an area or, you know, might be England or the UK that your sign is recognized for, for what you're putting on offer goods or services. So you might have that and you might even be able to register a descriptive term like Claire's cupcakes if, you know, Claire has a bakery, for example you might have that consumer recognition evidence. But if you don't, just avoid descriptive terms. And the benefit also of, of having something that is just your own or being, being sort of invented is that, yes, you have to build around it, but once you do, nobody else can claim it. If they do, 
you can stop them because you know consumers will when they see something you've invented as a word so the example of that was codec right codec was not a word before in in language it's a made-up word and and it it got the best type of protection because when they sort of built the brand it was something that consumers would link to to you know photographic materials and the like and that's why things like codec bicycles and even with different sort of spelling and codec with double d or double k or whatever it would be stopped because it's it's a made up word um we're not always in the position of making up words but at least think about things that will work well in consumers minds so this is something we call distinctiveness something will be a good trademark if it has the potential to signal the commercial source to act as a beacon of identification for consumers in the marketplace so this question of what is a good trademark i'll start with a question of do you think apple is a good trademark apple Claire, what do you think? Is Apple a good trademark? Um, I don't know, but I can't get Kleenex out of my head. I was going to ask you about Kleenex. Yeah, Kleenex is Kleenex is something that we call um, genericization. So it's not genocide, but it becomes yeah. generic. So it's the same term. Yeah, and people Google, like past the Kleenex. It's not. It's not made by Kleenex. It's just a tissue. So um, that's. The that's the threat where trademarks become victims of their own success. And that's why you'll see Google fighting really hard against people using Google instead of browser in order not to lose their really well-known trademark. So they will say every time they'll say Google is a registered trademark. Do not use Google when you mean browse. So if you mean browsing by Google, just say browsing by Google. Or, you know, yeah. it's only Google when, when it's you know, browsing by using Google. But Kleenex was absolutely one of those that lost protection in certain parts. So, you know, consumer recognition also varies from country to country. So there are certain things that UK consumers will be really well accustomed to and they will know, you know, here in this country, you have these huge chocolate wars between, you know, Cadbury and what is the other one? I guess it's Nestle that's fighting with, with them. Nestle and Cadbury will always have chocolate wars going at it. But Cadbury is not that big in continental Europe. It's not part of the marketplace. It's not as big as it is in the UK. Just like Hershey bars is something that I only know because I teach trademark law. I've never ever bought a Hershey bar. Well, not at home. And here in the UK, probably you have them. I don't know. It's not something that it's in, in, in my mind. So even consumers, uh, so different marketplaces will have different reception, will receive the trademarks differently. So what the who the average consumer is, it also depends on the language you use and, and other things. So, you know, life as a trademark works differently in the UK than it does in China, especially if it's written in English letters life. It's a generic descriptive term in this country. It's not that in other countries where the native language is not the, the official language is not English and so forth and so forth, right? Um, but um, so Kleenex was one. The other one is Escalator. Escalator used to be a trademark. It used to be that there was a specific manufacturer and then yeah and then you know they lost their trademarks and the same with Z uh, Xerox machines so the copiers oh uh, yeah 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 so they become sorry I've just completely digressed you were asking if um, Apple was a good trademark um I kind of want to say no okay um, I don't see much interaction in the chat, so I would agree with you, Claire, on on no. If if we're thinking about anything that has to yeah. do with apples, whether it's yeah. apple scent that's involved, apple juice, or or you know, biscuits, apple pie, anything that has to do with that, or even if you were to think about you know, um, items that usually have a scent so that they're more. Um, more easily to, to be sold. So things like, you know, detergents and other things, they might have an apple scent to them, right? 
So they would be descriptive for that. Um, but um, Apple for computers is actually a brilliant trademark because it's something that is so different. Not food related. Mm. Yeah. And, and that's why it works well. Um, um, another example of that was North Pole for bananas because they don't grow in the North Pole. So actually reversing it works really well. Consumers will recognize, all oh, right, yeah, bananas. Yeah, North Pole, fruit, bananas. It's, it's very easily recognizable because of that. It has that surprise element. So it, it's either a made up word or it is um, something that would not, so the opposite of descriptive. It's not something that people would say is descriptive of the product. It's something that surprises you. It's not easily made. That jump is not easily made. Um, and a US example, which let's see if it works in the UK, usually at least in law classes, it doesn't really. Do you know what chicken of the sea would, a chicken of the sea, there we go. I, I've given it away. It's been a long day. Oh, no, no, I haven't. So what is chicken of the sea? Oh, uh, okay. Is that? So if a trademark is chicken of the sea, what is the product we're selling? So Rebecca is going for cod. Let's let's yeah. gather. Uh, let's gather. Um, yeah, I was going to say tuna something. Um. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have Tiasha as well. Rebecca. <laughs> it is fish, but yes. Yeah, so chicken, just like a type of meat. So chicken is something that's sort of broadly a, a variety of a type of meat, lean meat, um, white meat, whatever you want. And it is actually tuna. So chicken of the sea is used in, in the US for, for tuna. But I can see how in, in the UK it could be quite as easily caught because it's the more typical fish, if you will, uh, in terms of what what's served, right? So there, chicken of the sea is something you still have to think about a little bit as a consumer. Whereas, you know, um, what we've seen descriptive in, in some of the cases was um, double mint, double mint for chewing gum. Because, you know, yes, we don't know exactly what double mint stands for. It, what is the regular amount of mint? And this is a double mint, or does it mean just extra strong or really minty? But you know, it goes to flavor. It, you know that that's not chewing gum with, you know, not with a minty taste, if you will. So um, it's really fascinating to, to go into these things. Um, so um, if you do have a question of whether or not your trademark is going to work, it depends on who, who your average consumer is and what you're trying to attach it to. So what are the goods and services? So remember always this example of apples, right? Apple might be an excellent trademark for, for computers. <laughs> not might be. It has proven to be one of the more valuable brands. And it's really easily recognizable, right? You can have all, so many permutations or... You know, when you say apple, and it is within the context of not actually food, you will be thinking about computers and, and you know, phones and other things. But if it's apple for juice or not, it's even generic. It would never be registered. Okay, let's now look at the fun bits around, um, and this is a reference for, for Banksy and his shenanigans around trademark and copyright law. So what can't you put on the, on the register, right? So there are certain things to think about, but there are also certain limitations, right? So if you were to think about, and there have been developments in the US which actually uh, got rid of these bars and limitations. So you can literally put curse words on the register in the US. Um, and people have been sort of uh, um, receiving that particular uh, decision from the courts uh, with different, um, different uh, impressions, I guess. So it's been very controversial that the US courts got rid of morality checks and free speech checks and uh, even things of racist slurs and others. So there's no check in what can be put on the register in the US. So that was a recent development from a few years ago. Um, and, and it's based on the free speech considerations in the US the constitution. In this country, however, we still have that check. So if something would be deemed to be immoral, um, by the general English population, by the general UK population, then the courts, and of course the courts would do that in, in current times, so they would not say whether something has been offensive 20 years ago or it might do so in the future, so the, when they accept the application they'll say, is FC UK offensive, right? 
FC UK was something that um, was registered in the end. So you do see it in, in, in High Street or you know, all across the UK. Um, and of course their practice was not that they meant to have a play on words and actually say the F word. It's just their standard sort of, so you have it for FC, it's meant to be French connection in the UK. So it's sort of an abbreviation and they follow that pattern in, in other jurisdictions as well. The other one, which I, I shall not say we're being recorded, but you see what it says on the slides, so that was rejected on grounds of morality. And there are other examples of where this particular area of the law has really worked well. So there have been attempts of trying to register trademarks of the MH flight, the one that was lost, so MH, was it 107? Or I don't remember exactly the number, but they tried to register that as a trademark. And again, it was refused on grounds of morality so that it would run counter morality. There were some, some people who wanted to register Je suis Charlie Hebdo. So you remember after the terrorist attacks in France a few years ago, again, there were some certain businesses or individuals who wanted to register those phrases, a combination of phrases, again, as a trademark. Of course, not with any other intent, but to make profit from something that was a really disastrous event. Um, so sometimes these rules work really well, um, but sometimes they're just sort of a little bit funny. One of the cases that has been a little bit taken differently or accepted differently was registration of comfy balls. Can you imagine what comfy balls would be for? It was rejected in the US back when those rules still existed, but in continental Europe, it has been registered. So the registered trademark applied for was for underwear, specifically for male underwear. Right? And in the US, they said that that registration was immoral. So you can see how this assessment of morality and what would be seen to be unacceptable by the general public will change with time and place. Now, you know, sometimes you would try to provoke. And if you're trying to do that, if you're trying to have a registered trademark that would elicit a response from your consumer, keep this in mind. You have to be aware that potentially, uh, if you were trying to, you know, register the C word, you might not be able to. Or there's a high chance you won't be getting a registration for the C word because it's still considered to be you know, inappropriate in, in, in the UK context by the general public. So that's one thing to consider. And if, if you are sort of you know, denouncing all IP rights or when you're registering a trademark, it is absolutely clear or you make it clear that you're making a point by registering maybe to control what's happening in the market, but you didn't really have the intent of using it then you might lose it as Banksy did. So just a few days ago, so it was just the end of May, it was reported Banksy lost this registered trademark, exactly for the reasons that when registered this trademark, uh, the intent to use it on goods and services was never there. The aim of registering this trademark was always to try to get around copyright laws to get some kind of control over this particular a picture of the monkey by Banksy. So, you know, Banksy is still anonymous, so so uh, not it's his, his or her, their identity, I don't know. Their identity is hidden from, from the sort of general public eye. And if he wanted to, he or she or they wanted to ever go to the courts based on copyright laws, that would not really work. So one way they were looking at sort of circumventing those rules were perhaps through trademark rules, but as I told you, so this registration has been um, lost just a few days ago, really. Okay. So that's that's one consideration. So you you have to think about what you're putting on the registry. But again, it, it depends on what your artistic practices are. And I did want to just sort of bring the. Can you sort of think of what this par What is this parody of? Chewy Lewis, Chewy Vuitton, Chewy, or even if you know from the symbols. Anyone making any links there? Christian Dior. Um, yeah. Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton, isn't it? I think. But we, you know, if you think of the bag and the symbols and even the combination of colors, I think, isn't it that one of their traditional bags has this golden against brown? 
um, but but it's not so this is not a, a more they did try to sort of uh, work more on the safe side not to exactly reproduce so that it would be clear that it's a parody so this is just a, a slide to hold that if you are an artist in in the uk and you're trying to use other people's trademarks in your own work to you know for for a point of humor or mockery you need to be careful the consideration so the defenses that are available in trademark law are linked to competitor uses so if you're thinking about using other people's works um, other other people's trademarks for describing second-hand services or the spare spare parts that you're using you can use other people's trademarks if they're also your own personal name so that own name defense is no longer available for companies um, but these defenses are very very limited so we don't have a, a defense that spells out as parody so you need to be very careful with parody and and trademarks um, yeah, but in the US, we had actually cases that so Louis Vuitton actually lost the case against Chewy Vuitton, which was absolutely hilarious. Um, okay. The other case, if you want to Google, is uh, my other bag. So you can just put it in. I don't have all the pictures, although this is my absolute favorite part of trademark law. So my other bag. So th there's this company that had that made linen bags you know how you have them for either going to shop in the market or maybe go to yeah. the beach side so it's just plain bag made of cloth and uh they would have on 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 the first side they would have something and then when you flip it, it says my other bag is sort of in, and then they would have representations either of louis vuitton and other well-named branded bags it's obviously a hilarious point to make but there were certain companies that came after it and again, in the US, the court said, this is obviously a parody, stop suing everyone. But that's much easier to do when you do have a defense which exists in paragraph 43C of the Lanham Act, which says parody is one of the defenses when you have claims for these marks with reputation. So in the US, they're called famous marks. Um, so it's just super fun to, to see these cases in practice. Um, there's a comment from James. He asked, could he use Three Wise Monkeys pictorially as a trademark? Um, I'm not sure where the, um, the question is coming from. So as a um, copyright owner, probably nobody would really come after you. The, the trademark itself has been cancelled now. But, so Banksy doesn't have a trademark registered. So technically it's out there and open. Whether you want to go down that route or not, because Banksy could always come forward and say, this is my work, I'm claiming my copyright rights in it. They are currently choosing not to do that. They're currently choosing to keep their identity um, hidden and not go for copyright infringements. Um, so I'm not giving legal advice here as such. So this is a very specific question around so technically, when something is cancelled and taken off the registry, it's in the public domain. Okay, what you have with monkeys is you have uh, also to consider the copyright protection because they're graphic works, right? And they're artistic works and they're protected under copyright. Um, and um, there are certain um, representatives also around um, Banksy and their work. And they're very active. By no means is, is Banksy lazy with, with intellectual property questions. It's a strategic point, and you can see that how they litigate these cases. They're very, very active on this. What would their reaction be of, of, of a third party? Uh, probably it would also depend on what, what you would be using them on or for. But my, my, my question or my sort of suspicion will be that if they're that involved in this whole trying to control the the image of the monkey they would probably not be very happy with somebody else trying to step in and register it um, as a trademark okay 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 so just sort of can you choose anything 
within the sort of the discussions we've had, so we said that the limitation is on sense, right? Practically, we don't have an objective way of putting in on the register. There are certain rules also around colors and um, shapes. You need to think about anything that is functional will not be put under the register. Why not? Because there are certain rules around, we don't want to have other competitors being robbed of things like colors, if you will. Um, or shapes of, of a chocolate box. So if a chocolate box shaped as a heart would be given to one company only, it means that all the other manufacturers would not be able to use that. So there are certain rules around um, signs which could be functional. So that's shapes, colors, uh, and sounds as well. But if you're thinking about words, the only thing you would want to avoid is a descriptive where so things like sweet for chocolate or things like you know Claire's cupcakes if Claire is owning the um, the bakery or whatever it is yeah so what is a good trademark remember the uh, the Apple conversation we've had it depends it depends on the consumers and the goods and services you're thinking of uh, selling and when you are thinking when you are exploring the register you need to not only look for identical matches but also similar matches as well okay when you have marks with reputation don't go near it yeah don't try to register something similar to mcdonald's or something similar to louis vuitton and others um, they have broader scope of protection, so they will be covered, they will be able to stop you, even if your mark is only similar to theirs, and you're using it on different goods and services, they have the right to stop all types of activity. And what does it look like? So this is all online, right? You just go trademark search UK. Um, there's a specific form for searching a trademark. And I think the way it works is the easiest way to work or to, to search for them is through words. And then once you found one word mark, you can click on the owner and then try to see everything that that owner owns. Because I think the search through images is a bit more difficult. It, it doesn't seem to be as obvious. Um, so just play around a little bit to see everything that's on the registry. And so you, you also have quite a bit of guidance when you sort of, there's a different portal to, not a different portal, it's the same portal, but a different page that actually walks you through step-by-step step, apply to register a trademark. So almost everything we spoke about today from a UK point of view will be here. So, you know, register trademark, what you can and cannot register, how to apply and what happens after you apply and what is this, the type of protection you get if you don't decide to register as well. So they will explain registered trademarks and unregistered trademarks as well. So these portals are open to the public and then there's a little, quite a little bit of a, a description on there as well. And the fees that are attached to that, and I think that goes to Beatrice's question around international. Although no, I'll leave that for, for Elizabeth. Elizabeth is actually working on her PhD on the creative industries in Nigeria. So let's leave that question to her. I'll just make a point. If you look at the, how much it costs, right? So you see that application to register trademark one class is 200 pounds. So when we're looking at these kind of expenses, business assets and this kind of thing, this is not such an investment that it's not worth making if you're actually active in the marketplace. If you're not, then fine, you know, no problem. But if you are dealing with goods and services, then thinking about strategically, if not now, maybe in a year's time or whatever, thinking about this happening should be at least part of your, you need to be aware of why you have to, why you have done it or why you've chosen not to do it. And you can see that when you have this international registration reference here, again, intellectual property rights are territorial so you can't get one global trademark but the way the system is set up is it will make it easier for you so it's sort of like a one-stop shop you go to one of the intellectual property offices you register you tick all the boxes and i want one here and i want one there and then that office will send it out and all offices will treat each of those referrals as their own application as if you had gone to Nigeria, to US and let's say Canada or whatever, New Zealand and made the application there. Okay, but there is no uh, global trademark, if you will, as such. 
Again, if you have a very famous trademark, it doesn't even have to be registered to get protection. But that's not something that we usually sort of uh, talk about in, in this kind of context. So um, when you have really well-known trademarks, they don't even have to be registered to get protection. So for, for argument's sake, let's say that McDonald's was not a registered trademark in China, it would still have protection under international rules because it's that well known across the world. And there are international rules around protecting such well known famous trademarks across the world, at least in all member states of, of some of the international rules. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to comment on the Nigerian question? Yes, I was just typing. Um, you can yeah, chat, chat with us, maybe yeah. it's easier oh. for you. Yeah. Ah, well, okay, Elizabeth apparently is going to do it uh, typingly. I thought she would comment, so I stopped speaking, but I think she's muted herself. Oh, I will type. I have like, a little bit of noise in my background. So that's why. Okay, um, I will I would type an extensive response, but um, <laughs> generally, yes, you can um, you can register trademarks in Nigeria. Um, how can you register in Nigeria to recognize internationally? Um, I think with the way it works in Nigeria, because I have registered trademark in Nigeria, you would need to um, register a trademark in the um, country you would you would also want the trademark to be effective in. Um, but in to register the, the process for registration in Nigeria, I'm gonna run it through through in the chat box right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and uh, James has said the parody defense, yes, in US, not in the UK or Europe. So there were changes in the um, rules on uh, in the EU a few years ago, I think it was around 2017. So the directive itself was 2015, then made law here in this country 2018. And they first started with parody being one of the new defenses, but then through the process itself, parody was deleted from the new defenses and it now only features in some of the introductory points that this is an important consideration but we don't have a, a, an express reference or a express defense in there um, just before the um, we continue with the questions or whatever else people want to say is i wanted to just sort of highlight um, because i think for artists you would want to have a, a, a trademark connected to who you are or your name, right? So there's this great desire to actually say, well, can't I just use my name and have it registered as a trademark? If you are interested in that area or that kind of a trademark, think about you know celebrities and you can search for what they've done in their own practices. You don't always have to be that literal to actually get protection as a trademark that sort of speaks to your name. So can you imagine who this is from? These two trademarks, who they belong to. First, do you recognize the letters? That, hmm? Victoria Beckham. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, Victoria Beckham, yeah, yeah. I mean, she has a number and all the Beckham's kids and everyone has their names registered as trademarks. And, you know, you can look in the, if you want, we can then sort of, uh, you know, if you just type in Google niece classification, so like this. But if you want, uh, I can also send the link. So if you just sort of search for niece classification, it gives you all the all the 42 classes. Up until 34, it's goods, 35 onwards is services, and just see where you fit, right? Um, and obviously, uh, Victoria Beckham, so for nine is just sort of a limited class and obviously something she wanted to use in regards of that. But then you have the, the second one, which is sort of very broadly um, covering a range of goods and services, 35 being the advertising and all those connected type services, right? So you don't always have to be as literate, literate, literary, literate, literate with the, you know, just having Victoria Beckham. And I'm sure the Beckhams have had those as well, but there are ways around that if, if you want us just to use something that will be used. This is more, it actually functions probably, functions probably more like a logo almost. So it's a figurative trademark. And that's something you can also always think about how you could use as well. Yeah. So that brings me to the end of my prepared talk, as you will. Um, but we have 
a few questions. So the Madrid Protocol is an international system where the countries that have signed on to that, and the UK is part of it, um, agree to help each other with the application process. So you go to our intellectual property office, by go, I mean, right now it happens all online, um, and, and the move has been to reduce that physically going to offices anyway, even for COVID. So you go and you designate countries. So you have to select countries that you want to register your trademark in. And Madrid Protocol is just a mechanism by which it makes the formalities, the red tape, easier. So you'll pay a certain fee, and that's why you saw under fees you had sort of charges under the Madrid Protocol system as well. Um, but once those applications for a trademark registration are sent out to different countries, then they're treated and assessed under their rules. Okay, so if you designate the country of registration to be in the US, then the US Trademark Office, the UK, the US Trademark and Patent Office will take over the registration process there. Okay. Um, then there is a question around um, if your trademark is rejected, do you have to make another application and pay the fee again? Well, yes, but you would also have to um, probably revise it, right? So it depends on also why it's rejected. Um, I'm just stop sharing. Let me see which button. Ah, there we go. I think we're all back in the room. My buttons sort of. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to chip in there? Because I know you've got your hand up. Hi, hi, Claire. I'm sorry. Yes, I was typing. I typed the answer. I just realized um, it was actually easy for me to, to read it out and explain. I think I just needed to get my thoughts down. I'm just that kind of person. Um, so, for, so Beatrice, um, hi. Um, yes, you can register a trademark in Nigeria. Um, I would, if you're asking for the website, I will send that in the chat box as well. Um, or similar to what you need to do in the UK, um, um, the basic requirements, you need the logo, um, the name of the applicant, your contact details. Then, but in Nigeria, you need a power of attorney. And then when you pay, um, it lasts for up to seven years, but then at, when it expires, it can be renewed from time to time. But um, the, um, this registration after seven years lasts for 14 years. So that's, I register, I have seven years protection. And then every 14 years, I have to renew um, renew it and this is the same thing you need your power of attorney you need your initial trademark certificate but um i think what you care about is if you know it will be recognized internationally and uh, um trade, trademarks um there's a principle called the principle of territory i struggle in pronouncing this so i wanted to type it but it's territoriality principle um but basically it just says that um, different owners of an identical trademark they have their own exclusive rights in their own individual sovereign country. So if I register a trademark in Nigeria, um, it's covered overview globally as well. Yeah. It covered it's covered in um Nigeria. And if I need if I want to register a trademark, if I if I need my trademark to work in the UK, I need to register um the on the trademark um register the trademark in the United Kingdom. And Doctor has already given us the rundown of the um process here in the in the UK. I think the only difference between the registration process between Nigeria and the UK is the need for the power of attorney. Um, if you know, Nigeria is like big on power of attorney. So I hope I hope that works. I hope that answers the question. I think it does, Elizabeth. I think, you know, we are academics, so never ever forget, right? Um, I try to sort of explain it differently as I would to law students because I don't like to talk about statutes or treaties or, you know, provisions, uh, burden of proof, things like that, because that's obviously not the audience, but we're academics and yes, there are certain practicalities around it, but do we know exactly all the steps in a Madrid um, um, registration? No. And by, by no means do we know it as it currently stands, because these are technical processes that do get updated, revised and checked regularly as well. Um, well, I think for Beatrice, I think the main thing you should um, know is for, together with what doctor has said, because you know, and if you know Nigeria just copies everything the UK does, but the <laughs> difference is in Nigeria, the registration process, you need a power of attorney. Uh, you don't need that here. 
Um, we could actually just go online now and register a trademark. But in Nigeria, you need um power of attorney. So I did send for Nigeria. So that's why I want to just share with everyone. If you are interested in how it works in other jurisdictions, right? Um, World Intellectual Property Organization is a very a wealthy database, if you will. It will give you not only the overview of the international framework, so what do we have in terms of international rules, it also signposts you very helpfully to the official website. So if you are interested in the you know, registry, registration office, the deals with trademarks in the US, just like I found the link for Nigeria, it's all there, it will connect you. It will also tell you what are the current rules and so forth. I would sort of su suggest that that's not something you would want to do on your own, um, unless you're like we are nerds that deal with intellectual property law. So that's what, why we're so interested in this. Um, but especially when it's in other countries, it can get very technical. And in the UK, you will understand the environment, the business environment, completely different than how rules are perhaps done in the US, unless you're really active in the US. And then perhaps that's more, more your place where you want to be. Um, so World Intellectual Property Organization has really good um, sort of resources. And if you want, there's also on YouTube, we have really cute cartoons that explain some of the intellectual property rules. And you would think, oh, cartoons, no. But it's something I also use and refer to uh, when you want to explain the basics. These cartoons are not done with a view to patronize everyone uh, or anyone. They're done in a way with the government wishing that more people would take advantage of intellectual property. So the, the information, especially when it comes to rules and laws, is delivered in a more accessible format. Um, so it's really good um, for for you know, if you wanted to know a bit more as well. Claire, are you going to open a, a bakery? Um, well, I've already opened a jewelry shop, so. There you go. So do you so have accessories, accessories? So do you have a trademark then, Claire? No, I don't. I don't. No, not at all. I was thinking of Claire's accessories because that's really, um, you know, really big. Um, um, no, I haven't actually, but this is kind of, you know, it's kind of making me think about, do I need to do that? And yeah. Well, you know, if you wanted to stop somebody else selling fakes of your products or pretending that somehow they're spin off, especially when your accessories take off um, and online, for example, right? We've spoken last time and the, 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 in one of the earlier workshops that when you're looking at Instagram, Facebook and other platforms, Amazon, eBay, if you see somebody selling fakes or pretending they're you and you actually have a registered trademark, then the online complaint process is very easy for you. You'll just sort of raise the ticket. You'll say, this is a trademark infringement. This is my right registration number, blah, blah, in the UK. And, and you report it and that will have to be taken down by the platform. So, you know, when you are, if you were to think, I don't know whether you're going to be selling things online, but if this is potentially something, so you do have in, in the online environment through platforms, registered trademarks are also a way of, you know, making it much easier to show that you do have that intellectual property right. Sorry, did you, did you answer that? Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you, Isaac. Did you answer the question about um, TM and R? I'm actually oh. multitasking at the moment, so I might. If 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 you have oh, yeah, answered it, then I'm sorry. Did you, did you yeah, actually, that? you know what? Sure. You know what? You can ignore the one about Britain coming out of the EU. That's probably complex. But um, can you use basically? Can you use the words TM as a warning? Because um, I know R is when you know R is the legit one, legitimate one, and um, that means you've registered it, but often people use TM. How effective is that? I mean, you know, effective, it, it has no legal weight in the UK uh, in the sense that, you know, you you will have some high, somehow a different uh, set of what you're entitled to if something were to go wrong or if you were to go to the courts. If you just want to alert people that this is a registered trademark and you don't want to just have the smaller fonts to say star and then on the bottom of your website, this is a registered trademark number blah, which you can do as well. If you want to use the TM, nothing's stopping you. Does it, give you any, mm. does it give you any extra protection if you don't have a registered trademark? No. 
Um, so if if you have, you know, it's sort of a question around what will work best in, in the marketplace. Probably people, when they do see some kind of a sign there, they might think about it at least. Mm, yeah. Um, the reason the reason I ask this is because I come across a lot of businesses who who are basically startups, and often they don't even have the money, the two hundred pounds, to pay for a registered trademark. Mm -hmm. Have a they have a brilliant idea. And as soon as the idea is out in the market, because it's not registered, somebody can nab it. So it's that it's just the thing about the small business person. But but ideas protection, yeah. But ideas themselves are never protected as such. So thinking about <laughs> business models, they're not protected from their copyright or patents for failing to meet all the requirements. Okay, and can I yeah. So basically I, I I get the idea that ideas are not protected, but when when they've decided to trade, maybe they need like six months to recoup some capital to pay for the, because when they're starting they can't they can't afford the two hundred pounds, but maybe after like two or three months of trading they can afford to protect their brand. So it's that period of putting their their product out on on the market, which is so risky for them because they just don't have the money to protect their yeah. brand. No, no, I know, but what is the risk that somebody will take their brand or their idea of what is behind the brand? Well, somebody with more somebody with with more money will register what they they see out there and just you know, and they have no legal right. If you have them. that, if you have that case, then somebody who's registered purely to take over your starting business, you're able to oppose their registration saying you're doing that in bad faith the only reason you're doing that is to prevent me entering and then benefiting in the marketplace and you'll be able to stop them if that's the only reason they're doing it so you know once you've made your entry to the marketplace public and so Unreg un 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 unregistered so yes. once you've met yeah okay uh-huh yes. and then that's somebody comes along and registers you will have a, a stronger case and you will have evidence that the only reason why they've registered is X and Y and Z, if that's the situation, then you'll be opposing their registration based on um, bad faith. Just okay. like, so it depends on the facts, right? So, but there are so, certain rules that will stop that. And also, so, the, just, just to, to, to add to that, one of the reasons you can also oppose to somebody else registering a trademark is if you're using it as unregistered and it's actually well known by consumers and you've decided never to register it. So under the passing off, let's say you are locally. So Claire, Claire is now opening a, a let's say, a, not a accessory shop, but she's opening a bakery. And actually in 10 years time, she has the best following ever in, in the West Midlands. And she's selected to use it, I don't know, let's say salt bakery, not gla not, not uh, um, um, Claire's bakery, but let's say salt bakery, right? And then somebody else comes along after those 10 years, because Claire has really built a following, and they try to um, establish or register salt bakery for their own products. And Claire has not registered her salt bakery on the registry. Once the proceedings are started, but you would have to be alerted to that. So that's all in the public domain, but you would have to keep an eye on that. Once the proceedings have started, you can oppose to them. You can say, you can't register that because I have built goodwill. It's unregistered use, but I have built goodwill and consumers recognize sold bakery as belonging or identifying my bakery. But evidentiary, it's much more difficult to show that. So. Whereas when you're trying to stop other people from registering the same trademark as you have on the register, you just show the registration and the number. If it's an unregistered trademark, evidentially you have to provide proof how long you've been in the marketplace, how many products you've sold in the past 10 years, any kind of consumer recognition evidence. So it's not impossible, but evidentially it's much more difficult to show and establish that case. If that helps, Isaac? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm quite happy to talk about the Brexit point as well. Um, it's it's actually so you have two types of situation now, UK having left the EU with trademarks, we used to have the same set of rules. So trademarks were actually one of the intellectual property rights that in addition to designs was completely harmonized. So all EU member states, all 28 had the same trademark rules. 
Um, so if you wanted to know what, what are the German rules on trademarks, exactly the same as in the UK. There was one instrument, EU, and it was made law in all 28 member states. So that was one, all rules were the same. The second one was you also had an EU, uh, so a regional right. You registered one trademark, it was in Alicante, there, that's where the office is. You registered one trademark and it gave you rights that we were discussing in all 20, uh, 28 member states. So that was one of the exceptions to territoriality. And that still exists, but the UK no longer has access to it. Now, there was, an, there was a uh, transition regime sort of follow through uh, and the specifics, if anyone was interested, everything's described in the government website. So if you had an EU trademark, whether or not it would be translated to a UK trademark, we could look at that separately. But what happens now is if you want to have protection in both the UK and EU member states, you have to do two registrations where beforehand you could um, just register one EU trademark and you would have protection elsewhere. So definitely trademarks are affected. Uh, when it comes to Brexit and Madrid, no, uh, the, the UK is signed on to Madrid as an individual member state. So you continue to have the same access with international registrations and Madrid protocol. That was the Brexit question. Um, yeah, I'm just keeping an eye on time. I think we've got, uh, sorry, Charles. Uh, I, um, I think I missed your question earlier on. So she just wants you to confirm that you said there's a law that says you can do parody on famous brands. In the US, we have this discussion. And of course you have certain conditions as well, right? But yes. If so, uh, the parody defense is covered under the broader type of protection when you're looking at trademark, famous trademarks, and you have in 43C of the Lanham Act, you do have an exception of parody. Um, so it's written for parody purposes, but you do have conditions there as well. Uh, and that doesn't exist in the UK slash EU. But we had that discussion. Was it with James or who did we have that discussion with? So it's exactly the same point. I think you yeah, yeah. yeah. So parody defense, yeah. yes, US, broadly speaking, no, UK, EU. Yeah. Sorry, I just had like a few add-ons here and there to what Dr. is saying. To yeah, Isaac. go ahead, comment. Um, but I was going to say generally, um, because I remember this was, I think, one of the first things I learned when I was learning trademark from Dr. Um, years ago, is um, if, you know, you know someone who's opening a business or something like that, I think it's it's common practice now where people are even like opening um, Instagram pages for their businesses and on Twitter, like, weeks or months before they actual, actually launch. So I think um, it's usually helpful to, I know it, it may cost 200 pounds, which is like, you know, outrageous people who, to, to, to it's outrageous period. Um, I think getting a trademark even before being established is super, super helpful as opposed to going down, down, you know, way, way later, even though way later you have passing off as a, um, as you know, a tool to help you if someone tries to infringe and all of that, but yet get, pursuing a trademark, at the initial stage, beginning stage, or you know, con trying to control your brand at the onset by you know even opening a page to establish that you know I have something coming soon. I think that that's really really helpful, um, especially in these times. So if that helps, I don't know. Mm, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to maybe uh, add a practical. Sometimes we forget that, but a practical tip for anyone that's associated with the university or you know you've just recently graduated that the university does have that program, the SPEED program and other support for graduates. And this kind of advice around business models and trademarks and this, this is exactly what you would be thinking in that first year where they're supporting you to sort of set up your own business. So definitely sort of look at that type of support if you're thinking about, you know, making it out on your own. I'm part of the SPEED project and I found it quite helpful and supportive, but um, yeah. I don't know whether it's okay to ask in this forum, but this has been really helpful for me. I'm an interior designer and I registered my limited company, Ivy Rose Interiors in 2019, but I haven't trademarked my brand and logo. So I did the little search as you showed us there. There is a company registered Ivy Rose, but I would want mine to be Ivy Rose Interiors. Would that be too similar? 
So my suggestion for you would be to think along the lines of Victoria's Secret. If your trade does your trademark really need to be Ivy Rose interior, or could you work it around? You know, because we still Ivy Rose, but as a figurative trademark, so there's something that we offer yeah. for the logo. Yeah, I mean, I have my I have my logo. This is a terrible example of it, but that that's the the symbol that I would want registered, which I've created, and I'm fairly certain nothing like it exactly exists. So you would recommend registering the logo rather than the text. Um, but have a look also. What what is the other trademark for? Do you have yeah, it's um, jewelry design. Jewelry, and you are in interior design. Yeah, right? yeah, it's correct. Um, so they seem to be fairly different. Um, it's mm -hmm. uh, it's you know <laughs> excellent. Well, look forward to seeing everyone at the next opportunity. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. And thanks so much, Mecca, again. You know, your knowledge Pleasure. is absolute gold. And, um, you know, it's really, really valuable. So thank you. And, um, yeah, see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.